Um, uh, but you know, we'll, it's a uh, the public board meeting is the typical format with a an update from from Holly on the operations. Uh, we'll do board committee updates. And then we have one main topic, which is the uh, Drupal 8 Accelerate summary and a discussion around that. So with that, I think Holly, you can kick off the operational updates. Okay. Well. Um... Yeah, so things uh, in, the, in the now usual format, highlights, uh, just things to talk about there. Um, try Drupal, um, something that we launched earlier this year. Um, we are, we now have six months of data under our belts for that, and it looks really good. So uh, average monthly visitors to that landing page is about 40,000 folks, um, which is great, and the clicks are really strong at about 20,000 a month. So, um, so this has been really great. We feel like we're doing what we set out to do, which is both, you know, driving Drupal adoption and also, uh, you know, giving value to the companies who are part of the program. Um, this has been, I think, our, our biggest and best revenue experiment this year. So, um, you know, it's definitely performing. Those numbers are above what we had projected for them to do quite significantly. So we feel really good about that. Um, we also, in September, rolled out some marketplace changes, um, and now companies on the marketplace are um, organized by issue credits from the last 90 days, and uh, it's nice to see those changes up there. I think the marketplace you know, looks a little better, but most importantly, um, we're seeing that it's doing what uh, I think Dries really called for in his Amsterdam keynote in terms of... Um, encouraging participation from companies. Uh, so I think when we first launched the changes on the marketplace, the company that was in, in the last position on the first page had something like eight commits in the last 90 days. Um, and now it's, it's well above that. Um, issue credits, not commits, sorry. Uh, in the last 90 days, and now it's well above that. And I think uh, you know, that's partly because people are beginning to adopt that issue credit um, but we are also getting evidence all the time anecdotally uh, from companies who are excited to see it and are actually really trying to work their way up the ladder. Uh, so, so that's really great. And there's more iteration to do there, but uh, it's definitely doing what that set out to do as well. We, we've been doing so anyway, I know that we see that in the data from the traffic on our site, but has any of, have any of them actually said that they've gotten business? Uh, we actually have heard some people saying that they're getting more uh, referral traffic from Drupal.org. Um, specifically, they think they're getting it from filtered pages. So typically, whenever somebody has narrowed down the filter to a particular sector or a location, so if it's by country. Um, so we're definitely seeing some improvements there for folks. I, I would say from the kind of the raw first page of the... Uh, uh, the marketplace. I, I haven't seen like incredible number of shifts for like say Acquia, who is already even even without front page placement was getting the majority of the referral traffic from uh, from the marketplace. So um, it's definitely affecting people further down the chain um, a lot. It's it's been it's been fun to watch. I can ask our um, look at all the stats. Have someone look at it because we're like, we we're the company that should be affected because we were in. You know, scrollable land, and then now we're on the front page, so it'll be interesting to see. Yeah, I'd love to get some feedback from that if if you have it. Be <laughs> yeah, awesome. it's all Another thing I've been doing is I've actually been tracking the changes every uh, three to five days. I've been taking a, a snapshot of the page um, so that we can kind of see how uh, companies are moving <laughs> over time. Um, and that's kind of like low tech way to do it. I can also do it based on the data. Um, and I, I think at some point it would be really interesting to see kind of how organizations are using it. And also I will say in spot checking, we have not seen anyone abuse it, which was one of the concerns when we came out that companies would open up a project and make lots of commits and then give lots of credits to their own people. And that does not happen in practice. And so I've been, I'm excited to see about I'm excited to see that because it means the community is using it the way they should rather than trying to game it. Well, the flip side is I used to be on the at the top because my company's name starts with C, and now I'm nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> but your destiny is in your own hands, Donna. Yeah, no, no. 
you know, given all those hours that you have free to just jam on that. That's right. And also with my whole two people. Well, yeah. I mean, and I think that's one of the things that um, Josh has actually mentioned um, trying to tinker with is how do we show not just aggregate number of um, issue credits, uh, but uh, how do we maybe show that as a you know ratio to the number of employees? Yeah, yeah a relative it, it, number would be really interesting yeah. to see. Yeah. Yeah, yep, yep. Because at the moment it's you know pure pure muscle, um, you know pure numbers of bodies right. um, contributing is going to is going to win. And there's you know obviously. Yep. Um, yeah. yeah anyway. I, I talked about this a little bit at um, my keynote at Ned Camp uh, weekend before last, and it was kind of amazing to me because I started to talk about it and I finished a sentence, and then there was like spontaneous applause about it. So. People are really, I think, really excited about it. So that's great. Nice. So marketplace changes, um, and then this one's really mundane, but um, like, uh, like emotionally, it was such a win. Uh, but we got our, our European credit card processor was finally finally approved us, uh, and it, it was our first, it was our first choice. Um, and now that we have the banking set up in the UK and we have a European credit card processor, we can finally take all of DrupalCon Europe operations in-house uh, under our own services um, and not rely on you know any of the VZW assets. So um, we're doing setup for that right now, should be clear of that shortly, and then you know we'll be completely autonomous, which is huge. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, it only yeah. took two years. Yeah, that will be super awesome once we get there. We're getting close though, so. Yeah. Um, so. so that's a big win. Um, things to watch, we're still watching performance to mid-year adjustment. I know we'll talk more about this in the executive section, but, or session, but um, you know, I think the the net net is that on the expense side of the plan that we put forth, we're you know meeting or exceeding our, our, our adjustments overall. Uh, but revenue continues to lag that plan, um, particularly supporting partner program. So, um, uh, you know, we'll talk about some more details there. Um, but uh, you know, that's the thing we keep an eye on. Um, and then this was um, this was not really a problem in September. It started to crop up in October. But as soon as the RC one came out, uh, this is like I think the biggest low light for me. <laughs> as soon as RC one came out. Um, we had a slight elevation in site traffic, but the it's just a gigantic spike in in spam incidents. Um, and I know that was really tough for community members to try to wade through all that spam all the time. Um, so it's you know it's one of those things that when that happens, it is a constant battle, and almost nothing else can happen while we try to grind through that. So um, I know the team's really trying to think through how to manage the resources for when the actual release happens, because I can only imagine it'll be some level of crazy worse when that happens. This is true. And we've got lots of things that we've put in place. And I was I put out a blog post that was fairly vague, in part because you never tell spammers what your techniques are. Um, but uh, we, we do have some things planned that may do a little bit more wholesale removal of um, new account creation uh, by spammers, uh, which that's that's part of the biggest problem we have right now is we don't have a means to uh, stop the account creation process for people that are clearly spammers. Um, mm -hmm. And all the other things, if we tighten them down too much, frankly, our community can't, uh, a new member to the community cannot participate. And so we've been hesitant to tighten it down that far. Mm. What does it Fair mean enough. to have that spam problem? Like, what's the uh, implication? Um, like, I, you know, from, from a staff, like, how do how do we need to think about it, and how can we help you with that? I guess. Um, well, we we've got some great people involved. Uh, we've actually been working directly with uh, some of the Malum leads on uh, some tweaks that we could make there. We've put some code changes in place that uh, do a better job of. Um, basically reducing the value of our pages to spammers by, by changing some of the meta that's passed along. Um, I, I, in this particular case, I would say I'd like to take this one offline because I think there are some things where uh, we could we could get some help and we could get some uh, funding and support. Um, but it's not something I would really discuss in a public board meeting because, as I said, the, the, the reality with spam fighting is 
it's it's an arms race. And so anything we say that we're doing, they immediately begin looking at how to, yeah. how to use it to their advantage. So yeah. I'm and the real tension really hesitant. To, the real tension to negotiate the whole way through is the openness of the community versus how many gates you have to put up to keep spam from getting on the site, right? And we're just really trying to honor the community values while also um, you know, managing that, creating some of those gates. We have a, a pretty significant amount of human spammers as opposed to robot spammers. We've we've done the things that can block robots really well, um, but the reality is, is there are economies in the world that thrive on SEO placement, and 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 really that's that's what we're fighting against. Is they just want their word to show up on a page that has decent SEO ranking. So. Um, I've been uh, monitoring it pretty closely with Google as well, and we're not uh, negatively impacted from our own um, standpoint, other than on the individual pages that occasionally get reported through to Google. Um, so we're we're in a good position, but it is taking up way too much of our bandwidth. Um, and you know, there's entire conferences devoted to uh, spam fighting at scale. Uh, Facebook put put on one in 2015, and also I believe in 2014. Um, because it's it's a very real thing for open sites. So Twitter, Facebook, I'm not necessarily comparing us to that level, but we're that open, and so um, we're as much of a target. And that's that's that. Lots of other mm -hmm. stuff happened, but any any um, questions? Um... questions. All right, so board committee updates, Holly? Is that right? Nobody met. The end. <laughs> well, well, fi hey. Finance met yesterday. Finance met. We yeah. met. Finance met yesterday. My update was we hadn't met yet when I submitted it. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, I guess I'm going to keep moving. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're back on track in time way. So yeah, let's do the uh, Drupal 8 Accelerate uh, session. Okay. So I know you guys have heard an, uh, lots of updates, uh, but now that we've officially reached the goal, we just want to think about, you know, I want to take some time to think about whether we, you know, uh, to talk about the campaign, but also uh, the bigger picture of how and when the association tries to fund uh, project activities in the future. So. Just as a reminder of the timeline, we we really started this in, in January in earnest with the board, uh, recruiting the anchor donors, um, and launched it publicly in March and hit our goal in September. So it's, it was a nine-month process to raise that quarter of a million dollars. Um, we used CrowdRise for the donations. Um, and then there were a number of things that the association tried to leverage to um, get people engaged in the campaign. So we did put a sidebar block on ADO. We did not put any campaign assets on Drupal.org itself. Uh, we did direct emails to uh, association members and non-members in our database, but no direct communication, no direct emails to uh, anyone on any Drupal lists. Uh, we had email newsletter mentions, though. So like on the, in, the Drupal, um, in the Drupal newsletter, for example, part of the wrapper there included the campaign a few times, et cetera. Um, and then we also used social media. Um, and those were all pretty manageable because those are all assets that we we're you know, interacting with every day. So it wasn't a huge uh, lift to manage those things. Um, to give you a sense of how the donations rolled in, um, you know, in, in March, uh, when we launched the campaign, um, we started with $62,500 of anchor donations, right? So <laughs> that's why the number's so big in March. Um, in April, we did some direct uh, emailing and, and managed to boost up into five figures there. And then we also had a big bump around DrupalCon LA. A number of the partners and sponsors there at that event um, made contributions that were you know, four-figure contributions. So that was great. Um, and I think in August and September, as things started to heat back up uh, and Drupal 8 release actually looked close, uh, we saw a little more momentum there. Of course, we finished in Barcelona, thanks uh, to uh, one more Innovations donation and um, mm -hmm. finishing the campaign out at the at the keynote. 
um, thanks to XOVA, which was really cool. Uh, so just a sense of how the donations came in. Um, and then if you remember the campaign, uh, part of the CrowdRise platform allows individuals to create their own campaigns and do fundraising on their own for the overall campaign. And so I just wanted to give you a sense that of the top uh, donors, or it's the top campaigns, right? So people who set up their own uh, little subsite here uh, to, to do the fundraising, um, there were relatively few who uh, actually did uh, recruit donations from more than themselves, right? Or more than two or three people. So um, our top campaigners were Dresa and Donna from the board, which is great. Um, and Jeff, Woo! yep. Um, and, sorry, what was that? I, get, I, get a I had at least two of your conversations were like, oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, we already talked to Dresa. Um, <laughs> okay, yeah. Yep, so Dresa and Donna and Jeff, Jeff comes in uh, pretty well in there too. Um, and, uh, you know, everyone who, this might be a little hard to read on the screen, but everyone is sort of bold and italicized. Those are people who actually raised money from more than three people. Um, so just to point out that although in theory, like this crowd raising, crowdfunding idea is a great theory, it didn't in practice happen so much. Um, though we did email those campaigners, you know, as soon as they created um, a campaign site, they got an email and suggested ways to donate. And we gave them updates throughout the campaign, et cetera. It just... Um, I think most of what you see in there are people uh, or companies who created a fundraiser so that they could put their own big donation in there and be seen on the page, right? Which I also don't have a problem with. Thank you for the money, right? But <laughs> just to point out, it wasn't exactly, you know, uh, driven by crowdfunding. It was mostly our, our own communications um, and fundraising efforts that, that made it happen. I will say that it was a lot of work. Yes. Um, I mean, wasn't like smooth sailing in, in, in a way like we just do an announcement and people come to us. It actually took going after people yeah. and going back and back and back. Yeah. And, yep. Um, so. Yeah, and I, I felt like what, what I did a lot of was um, was emailing uh, my network, which is, which is um, putting – I mean, it's not something I could continue to do without putting – my own reputation at risk, like being the panhandler, but you know, emailing every CEO of a durable shop four times in four months uh, is about is about as far as I'm personally willing to go before I just start looking like, you know, oh god, here comes Jeff, he wants money. <laughs> you know, so I, there's a sustainability problem to going back to the well that we need to consider if we're talking about, like you said, sort of how do we do this again in the future? Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I feel the same way. Like you can only ask people so yeah, many times. So many times and then... Right. Right. Uh, so some other facts about the campaigns. We raised 250000 from 461 people. That made the average donation $544. And of course, that's grossly inflated by the number of five-figure donations that we had. The median donation was $50. So uh, your sort of average Joe was giving around $50 uh, to the campaign. Um, and that actually is a really interesting number because that is higher than most fundraising averages are. So um, it's good to know about our community. Um, and we also raised donations from 52 countries, which was pretty cool. Um, and only 44% of the donations came from the U.S. So I liked how representative it was um, of the overall Drupal community. Um, just to keep in mind that $75,000 of that 250 came from Anchor Partners. Um, and then, of course, 62.5 from the association itself. Um, there's not a lot of actual crowd raising going on, like I, like I mentioned. It was just eight people who had more than $500 from eight sources, or five sources. So um, issues that were raised during the campaign, um, <laughs> the one thing we heard a ton was, like, this is the saddest fundraiser ever. Um, why can't the community just come together and finish Drupal? And, of course, like, we knew why that was not going to be the case. Um, it wasn't like we needed more manpower. We needed more specific manpower. Um, but uh, I think that's just a thing to keep talking about in the community about how how Drupal actually gets developed. Because I think there, you know, obviously it's a community effort. Um, but uh, I think we do need to talk more about, you know, that specific man slash woman power that's needed. Um, because of timing and the feature set we were looking for, we didn't use an open source um, or Drupal specific 
fundraising tool. Um, and so, you know, if we were going to do it again, we might look at doing that differently. Um, and, and our tool was not super internationally friendly. You could only donate in U.S. dollars. And that's definitely a problem for our folks in a lot of places in the world. Uh, and there was a lot of concern that we were training contributors to expect payment for their work. So, um, you know, we'll have to. I would also add, um, I got a lot of people saying that it was amazing that we were able to raise that much money. But the yeah. flip side is I also had people say that it was kind of pathetic that we were only able to raise that much money. So right. I, I feel... From just from talking to people myself, I, I feel people were a little bit over the map in terms of how successful it was, I guess. Yeah. I would agree. I've heard, I've heard yeah, both con contradicting things. Uh, I, I want to comment on the training our contributors to expect payment bit. Um, increasingly, you know, because that's been raised a, a couple of times, but I think there's a, a flip side to that is, uh, are we also expecting, you know, in, in some ways, uh, open source is becoming a kind of slave labor for corporations. So that there's this this great infrastructure that um, the corporations are relying on, and are uh, um, you know they get this extraordinary value from, and yet we have this expectation that that it will be completely built for free by people in their spare time, and and it is a form of exploitation. So I think that's a counter narrative to that. You know, oh, it should all be free. It's like, well, you know. Do you do you get a wage for your work? Yeah, and I think positioning it, you know, part of when I talk to people, I position it as, you know, hey, it's you know, let's give these people a break. They've been working really hard for a long time. You know, they, you know, they're burned out. They need help getting over the line, and you know, this is one thing we can do. And and it's not something that we. Should should do always. It's not something that they're even asking us to do. It's just something that we need to help push forward and show a little recognition. Um, does that set in a precedent? I don't think so because I don't think we put enough money out there, honestly, to enough people that much of a precedent. You know. Yeah. I I don't think we paid, uh, you know, Sun or Chicks or Catch or any of these guys enough money to come close to the actual time that they spent. So it's really just, to me, it's like, you know, when you, when you do a nice gesture for someone, but it's not like, doesn't actually like fully thank them for what they did, but it's a nice gesture and they just appreciate the gesture. It's more in that camp than like, you know, but they got paid for their work thing. Did we get any direct feedback from, from them? From the contributors? Or from the, from the paid? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we definitely did. I mean, you know, I, I know from several people that they, you know, they were able to say no to client work to be able to do Drupal 8 work because of the funding. So we definitely did, I think, achieve what we had hoped for in terms of freeing people up to be focused because of the money, right? They would have kept working on Drupal 8, but they wouldn't have had the same time for it without the payment. I think that's the whole point of Accelerate. Yeah. People, people have different expectations and perspectives on what money in open source means depending on where they're coming from. There are a lot of like, and I, I don't mean this in a demeaning way, but like there are a lot of people who just sort of expect open source to work for free. And then there are people who are actually like in the trenches trying to get work done and pay their mortgage who have a completely different perspective on what open source money means. And so I think you can hear a lot of complaints from people who actually don't have skin in the game, frankly, mm -hmm. um, when it comes to funding open source and what that means and why, versus the people who are actually trying to make the things happen, doing the things that they're passionate about, but also literally trying to like pay for their kids' diapers and their mortgage while trying to do the things that matter to them. And so I think the feedback that we get is good, and aggregating that is good, but also keeping in perspective where that feedback is coming from is very important in terms of, of what that actually means in terms of the bottom line for the different people involved from different perspectives. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with that. Yeah, I don't, yeah, and none of these are things that I feel like are, are showstoppers. I just, you know, want to share some of the feedback that I, I heard as a concern, so we have to... <laughs> No, it's something we can message differently or 
uh, you know, think about in the future. You know, I think, I mean, like, you know, one, one thing that comes to mind is I'm, I'm probably a user of, I don't even know, there are different open source projects. But, uh, you know, even as somebody that's extremely passionate about open source, I'm only contributing to right. one or two or three. <laughs> right. You know, like, like uh, we're not contributing to OpenSSL. We're not mm -hmm. submitting patches to Apache. I'm not making changes to MySQL. And so, you know, I think a lot of people are just users. Mm -hmm. yep. oh. Okay, so just taking some of that data and some of the considerations in mind, so what we feel like worked from the campaign, I think one thing that we identified early when we were talking about it that really did work was to come out of the gate strong with those anchor partners. Um, I don't think we would have seen the momentum in, you know, March on rolling into DrupalCon, you know, without that. Uh, we just wouldn't have made the goal. Um, everything that we did, of everything that we did, nothing was as effective as a direct email in terms of driving clicks and then donations. That's all mm -hmm. that there is to it. So, um, you know, for all of the tweet your friends, this is the thing that does it. Cold calling. Hmm. Yeah. Um, using the cons to communicate with businesses and help them showcase themselves at those cons as donors was incredibly impactful at LA and and even in Barcelona. So mm -hmm. there's something about being all together in that space and using that all that energy and that momentum that really worked. Um, and so there we go. And um, we also got great support from the camps. Uh, there are several camps, there are about half a dozen camps that on their own and without an appeal from us decided that they would gift any net income from their camps to the Drupal 8 Accelerate campaign. So um, Denver was one and um, Twin Cities was another that I remember off the top of my head. And you know we should totally organize the camps better next time. Uh, for that kind of support, uh, you know, if if we did this sort of thing again. Um, and then I think a thing that we heard over and over again that was positive feedback, right, that the uh, transparency, like having all of those grants listed on a page and you could see who got paid what to do what work, uh, right, and you could see the impact of your donation, that was really meaningful for people, if only because they could see that we were taking that extra step to align the campaign with the, the values of the community. Uh, so people really appreciated that, and I do think it was a driver of donations. Um, if people were on the fence about it, it was a thing that helped tip them over. So those were those were lessons that I think, things that we would want to repeat or do more of in a, in a future situation. Did, did you guys have other um, observations about what worked? Um, I, I think uh, I think that your point about email was good. I think you know you and Karen and I went through some hoops in terms of access to a CRM and stuff. And I think if we had to do it over again, I would say getting our contact database or Salesforce or whatever um, absolutely scrubbed for who we did want to send to and do a lot of it through there. I think would be would be an improvement. Um, uh, I just think we could have we could have leveraged it, but you know it's like it's weird because like that you know because of the whole like sales team we don't want to step on the same toes with them and, and it just I think we could have could have harnessed that uh, if we started earlier, but it, it, once we really started pushing on it, it was too late. Yeah, agreed. Um, and I, I also heard one other thing I heard that wasn't um, necessarily so. By the way, so also did want to. Um, I agree with you about like the transparency of where the grants were going themselves. Like we talked about this being something you could direct people to in case they asked, and they did. And actually, more than one case on Twitter, someone was like, you know, whether they were being snarky or, or genuinely curious or whatever, you know, where do the funds go or whatever. It's like, boink, here's a link, and it's like that just shut everybody up. And I did that in email too to a few people. Like they're like. Well, I mean, how do I know that, you know, it's being prioritized well or, you know, whatever. It's like, I mean, people just ask those questions and, and to just literally not even answer. Just give them a link and be like, here it is. It's right here. 
It's all right here. Like that's huge. Yeah. It's huge yeah. to like convince people. Like no, nobody can say anything after. They can't come back and be like, well, really, you're gonna give fifteen hundred dollars to that guy for that bug? You know, I mean, it's like it's it's unquestionable, right? Um, and so that kind of transparency was great. I felt like the um, I think it was a hundred bucks an hour, right? I think that worked well too, like sort of yeah. setting the the rate so you don't have to be like right. negotiating or yeah, that's you know, a good point. very easy. So Everybody time to getting do that. paid the same. Yeah. Um. Hey, I have a question on that. How much money is left uh, in the grant pool? I knew the answer to that last week because I calculated it. Well, just roughly. I mean, I I don't need like exact. I am. I did a rough um, tally of what's on the page, um, and it, it looks like we'd spent about $220,000, but I don't know if the page was up to date at that point, and, and that was a couple of days ago. And Okay, so it's close. Yeah, it's really close, yeah. Okay. Yep, that's right. I just opened my spreadsheet. So it got us beyond RC1. Or, yeah. Well, RC1. To RC1, yeah, and I think um, when Angie's sort of fully back in the game, you know, we definitely have to talk to the core maintainers about what to do at this point. Uh, you know. If there's some money left that we could keep keep funding some grants? Right. Okay. Uh, but still... you know, I'm not sure where the RC candidate is and what may or may not need to be done there, right? So, okay. Yep. Okay. Any other lessons learned? Um, I would echo oh. what you said, uh, Holly, about the camps. I think that uh, talking talking to other camps after after um, some of them found out what uh, we were doing in Colorado, um, there was a general general uh, buzz of, "Wow, that's a great idea. Um, um, we'd love to do that." Yeah. I, I think we could have we could have we could have um, cleaned up uh, even if it was just a you know a quarter of the uh, of the uh, of the uh, gross profits or rather net profits uh, or ten percent of the net profits um, especially if we were to do something like provide some kind of badge to the camps or something like that so they could show their their support I think that that would be um, really really positive positive uh, 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 direction and. I think um, you know, provided there's a good, good, uh, good mechanism next year, um, Colorado is going to do it again. Awesome. So Holly, just one, one last thought on this, sort of the, the number and the amount and all that. Like, so I think, um, you know, whether it's it's great that we raised a quarter million or it's pathetic we raised a quarter million, um, we <laughs> we set a goal in a time frame and we did it, and I think that's a win. Yeah. And I I think we we definitely owe Kieran a thanks for challenging our original number, which if you recall in January in Chicago was or Portland or wherever we were, was like we were we were trying to do originally we, I think we set out to be exactly half that. That's right. Five. And you know, Kieran was like, Well if you're gonna bother to do it, why not go bigger? And he was right. Like I agree. Like because like we probably would have spent just it would take just as long. We would have spent just as much effort because we wouldn't have asked so many anchor donors. The DA wouldn't have matched as much, uh, and so we would have taken this probably the same amount of effort, and and would have gone through the same public process, whether it was 125 or 250. Um, but in the case of 250, it was enough to to get you know significant grants through. Whereas 125 probably wouldn't have gotten us that far. So right. I think. We we picked the right number. Whether that's too low in for who we are and or it should be, I think I think it worked. I think it was the right number. Yeah, I would also declare success in Big Three. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> I think it was definitely very successful. So. We didn't. I mean, we had no idea what we could do, and we did almost exactly what we set out to do. So I, to me, that's good. Yeah. Um. So just. Uh, quickly again things that didn't work right expecting I think I had some expectation that we'd have more crowdfunding come in um, and it happens it's just not going to be a significant portion of the fundraising total overall 
Um, and, you know, we really did not exploit Drupal.org as a channel at all. And no one looks at ADO in comparison. I mean, what was that? Was that in, um, really intention? Like intentionally, we didn't do that because I wondered why we didn't do that. Well, part uh, yes. <laughs> I mean, really, it's it was about uh, you know being concerned about. Uh, I think not really wanting to necessarily. It was a little bit about being able to go stealth with the campaign in the sense that um, you know I think we weren't really looking to. Um, elevate the attention to the kinds of conversations that we were already having around $250,000 is a pathetic number, it should be $2 million, or it's sad that you have to do this at all, right? Like, And the louder we were on Drupal.org about that campaign, the more we were going to have to answer those kinds of issues, you know? Uh, so it just, it didn't, it didn't seem like we'd be getting positive payoff for doing that. Um, I think now that we've done it once and we succeeded at raising the money in the future, we'd be in a better position to do it because we have a track record to point to and we can show how it benefited the project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I think when you look at what Mozilla Foundation does and what uh, Wikipedia does and, and so forth, they slap it right up at the top and they're they're unapologetic. Um, yeah. And and you know, this is a nonprofit, right? This is this is not. Unusual for non and uh, un unusual behavior for nonprofits to engage in. Yeah, and we're, we're running the membership campaign now, so now there's also a precedent for that kind of, you know, banner takeover on the site, that sort of thing. So we would just be in a different place with it, I think, in the future. Good. I think that's also a positive that's come out of it then. Yep. Um, like I said, it was actually really tough for international donors, and they usually give us uh, much smaller dollar amounts, but you know, you really want it to be a grassroots campaign. That's an important part, and we don't want to exclude people. So I would really consider yeah. that for next time. And also the exchange rate was a real bummer, like in terms of, say, the Linux Australia contribution. When they made that, um, the Australian dollar and the US dollar were at parity, but by the time it got paid, it was a lot less. Yeah. So that was kind of real sad. Then we had sads. Um, and then, you know, we were just on this for nine months at the association, so that was tough uh, because we were putting all of, we were trying to get all of our community's eyeballs on this for nine straight months, um, and that was, that was just a challenge when we had other things that we want people to look at and pay attention to also. Um, so we might want to think about timeline in the future. Anything else on the change it side of things? Okay, so moving forward, I just think, uh, you know, doing this in an ongoing way, like trying to fund core development forever is not a possibility the way we are today. Um, I think, you know, we'll build capacity and expertise in fundraising as we go, but like expecting that we would do this sort of long term and continue to provide investments for core um, contribution um, is probably not a reality. Um, and I think, you know, our time and resources are better spent trying to make contribution easier, whether that's through tooling or, you know, supporting mentors and camps and all the other sort of community building activities that we can do. But we can run these really periodic campaigns. I think it was a good thing and we should, we should do that um, and play a role in unblocking things. And I know that when Drupal 8 development got going, there were a number of initiatives, for example, uh, the CMI stuff, right, that needed funding to get it off the ground, right? And that's the kind of thing where I think we could step in and um, help those initiative leads uh, or the core maintainers, uh, you know, find eyeballs and audience for their needs um, and help them get that work done. Um, but, you know, it'd be great to know what those were ahead of time <laughs> so that we could plan for that work. Um, and I think that was part of our execution difficulty was, you know, just inserting this into stuff that was already going on. Um, it, it meant that, um, like competing prioritized just or competing priorities just didn't get dealt with because we had this thing that was ongoing forever. So, um, that would help us. Um, and of course we need to leverage Drupal.org a lot more if we were to do this in the future. I think it would help us find success a lot faster and that would be important because it's a long, hard log. So 
you know, in general, I think it's something that we should consider exploring um, as new initiatives or, uh, you know, feature features for um, upcoming releases of Drupal need assistance, uh, but not something that I think that we should bake into the association's programs forevermore in an ongoing way. I will say that I'm really glad that we that we did this. I think it was it was the right thing to do. I I, um, I do agree that that um, this can't be something we do. And I think that that we more on the community side than on the DA side need to to see think strategically about ways to prevent us getting in this situation again. And I think Dries has done that. And I think some of the changes that are already being made will help with that. But you know, I was looking back at the at the MidCamp keynote, and one of the things, one of my slides had the projection for when D8 would come out, and um, and it was at, at that the day we launched the campaign, it was February 26, 2016, and um, and you know we will have helped it not be February 26 um, of 2016, but we won't have influenced it that much, and I actually think that what we saved us is from slipping a date even further than than February, and I think that's pretty sobering. Um, so I'm, I'm glad we did it, but we really need to not let the project, you know, get in that place again okay. more systemically. It can't be the DA funding core to do that, so. Right. Well, I'm glad we tried. Um, I think we kicked up the meeting saying that the credits look promising. I think that's an area we could explore more. You know, we've, we've only really touched the marketplace, so there are more things we can do to see if that, that's going to help us. Right, in a non-fundraising capacity, yeah. So we've uh, already had some really good feedback about expanding who's contributing, expanding who we show as a contributor to be yeah. a wider group, including some of the, the big companies that are customers that are contributing back and those sorts of things, so. I think doing all of these things, from credits to occasional, you know, fundraising like this to yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think we have to use all the levers, right? And and we're just dipping our toe in the water with the marketplace stuff, you know. And there's so much more to be explored there, like making sure that we're incentivizing the kind of work that the community needs. As I think it's wonderful as a baseline to reward the work that people want to do, right? That That's open source through and through. Yeah. Um, but, you know, what we found at the end was that we needed to incentivize very, very specialized work that nobody wanted to do, and that, you know, that it, it was really tough and really specialized and, and really difficult. Yeah. And we need to find ways to, to really use, we need to identify and then use all the levers we have to help help the project be successful. Yeah. And it, we do we do have a lot of communication resource at our disposal, uh, and so you know I very much want to have a more close working relationship with the core maintainers and the initiative leads, so that you know they can say, hey, in three months I'm going to kick off this thing, and I need 50 people with this kind of experience, and we can help go direct that work, right, uh, or direct people to that work, not direct the work. Um, so yeah, there's a lot more opportunity there for sure. But, you know, I also think this was a really great example of our convener role, right? We do it a lot with DrupalCon, but I think this was a, the, the, a really great um, demonstration of, of that, that part of our role. So I was really excited about it organizationally. Yeah. Another, another way to look at it is there's people that can contribute uh, time and that can translate in commit credits, and then there's people that can contribute money but they may not have time to, you know, yeah. to contribute. So I think both of these things reach, potentially reach a different um, kind of audience. Fair enough. So we'll keep this in our arsenal of things we can deploy when it's really strategically important. Sound good? Okay. Sounds like uh, sounds like the the tact the strategies of a general the way you said it. <laughs> as a weapon we can deploy in theater. Yeah, 
Well, I will confess that I've been obsessed with reading books about Navy SEALs lately, so maybe that's why. <laughs> hey, um, Holly, um, I think we've, we've kind of wrapped up on D8 Accelerator. I wondered if we could have a quick um, update on the membership campaign. Yeah. Um, give me one second to pull up numbers. You may know by now that I can't remember anything ever. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, so we launched the membership campaign a week ago today in the afternoon, um, and that uh, so it's been running for a full week now. And the campaign uh, is a, uh, consists of the uh, banners that are on top of Drupal.org uh, every page, uh, as well as some you know email follow-ups that are also going out at Drip campaigns set up there. And the goal of the campaign is a hundred thousand dollars and a thousand new memberships. Uh, we started out with about 3,200 members. Um, as of Monday morning, that's the last uh, real stats I have for you, uh, we had sold 186 memberships. 117 were new, so 69 were renewals. That was great because we have a lot of brand new memberships coming in from this, um, and we sold a little over, so roughly $10,000 of that $100,000 goal so far. Um, so it is a nice solid start. There is no, like, it wasn't like we put it up and there's a rush at the gate to like buy memberships. But what we're seeing is basically 10 to 15 memberships every single day, which is way better than the zero to one to two that we were seeing every day. <laughs> so. Right. so I crunched the numbers and it said, so there's a $100,000 goal, but 1,000 members mm -hmm. and 70 days to go to the end of the year, which is, I think, an average of 15 members a day will get us to that 1,000 goal. So yeah. it sounds like we're kind of tracking um, towards that. Yeah, it might be a little on the low side, um, but it is, it's pretty strong. And, you know, the fact is we set these goals. We, have, like, we had no context to understand what was actually possible, right? So yeah. we've just never done anything like it. So we're definitely learning a ton. Um, and... Uh, we are also using it as an opportunity to experiment with calls to action and other kinds of things on the site so that when we launch other campaigns for other reasons, we know that green is the color, not gray, and use this kind of language, not that kind of language, and have the button in this kind of place. You know what I mean? Um, those yep. things that just help us with the conversion. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Holly. You bet. All right. Anything else, Holly, on this topic? I don't think so. All right. Uh, is there any other questions um, that we want to ask in the open session? If not, I think we should move to the uh, executive session. Sounds good. Thanks for the meeting, everybody, for all of those listening. Thanks, Rick. And uh, yeah, we'll see each other on the other side.